I've always assumed that I was one of the reasons that Jules left the band. Well, you among everybody else, man. I mean, you know, there was... Fuck you, I wanted to be special. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on the association, along with our very special guests, the two founders of possibly the greatest soft pop act of all time, purveyors of such fine, fine hits as Along Comes Mary, Cherish, Windy, and Never My Love, Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander from The Association. In a five-part series called from an unprecedented 13-hour interview, this is part two. In the next two hours, we'll learn how The Association's sophomore record, Renaissance, recorded five months after their debut, almost killed the band. We'll find out how many stars Jules and Terry give Renaissance from 1966 and Inside Out from 19. 1967, and also we have a top secret surprise third guest joining us tonight. Coming up, we've got Bob Nastanovich, Deer Tick, Corey Hansen from Wand rating his own discography, and Mike Watt rating the entirety of the Minutemen's output. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. And away we go then with Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander, not to mention a super secret surprise third guest as we ascend the marshmallowy pillow soft contours of (laughs) Mount Association, a vocal blend so magical they seem to exist in harmony with the winds that blew through the L.A. canyons turned a six and seven man mind cocoon ruptured by personalities bursting through (laughs) fully formed from a shared bedrock of self-effacing anonymity. Jules, actually, uh, we were on the phone and we were talking about, he said, well, at least, you know, we're halfway through. We're most of the way there. And I was like, Jules, we got (laughs) the the end of the first album. (laughs) Look at that punum. I just want to reach out and squeeze those cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> you guys feeling good? Everyone doing well? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. Can I get some toast? Yeah. Wait, what would you like? Uh, raisin toast or? Do you want marmalade on that? That's what I was thinking, too. Do you guys eat Harry and David foods at all? Yeah, I like that stuff. I, I don't know that stuff. In Texas, we may not have it. I have six Harry and David pears that this is the last day of. They're so delicious. Oh, yeah. Pears, when they get ripe, are good. I've eaten one. Heidi's not doesn't feel like eating any, and they're just going to go to waste. And they were sent from the East Coast out here. Jesus! So you have to you have to eat them all today, or bake them, yeah, or something. So make a pie, right? Pear pie. Is there a pear pie? I've never well, really. There's a blender you can put them in. You can make a pie out of anything. All it takes is crust. Yeah. And you see yourself as kind of a crusty specimen yourself, right? Are you crusty uh-huh. pie? Sort of how I would like to appear. Yes, yes. No, you're not. I don't think you are. I think uh, only a veneer. It's the M&M candy shell. Well. Everyone needs an armored coating. Fuck you, Dave. <laughs> no, I'm saying I think you have a tremendous amount of depth. That was not a put down. I thought in retirement before there was such a thing as Starbucks, I didn't think there were going to be any 1960s type coffee houses in America anymore. So I was going to have one and I was going to call it something edgy like Che, right? And I was going to smoke cigars and sit in the back booth and hold fort. I was going to be a wizened guy. A 24-hour pontificator. Yes. Yeah. I tell people in AA that I have a great nine-hour story. (laughs) (laughs) So economy and brevity is not your strong suit. Yeah. So this record came really hot on the heels from the first one. Back then, it was customary 
to try to fucking murder you guys, right? The record companies would almost literally try to murder you with the workload. So the first one was recorded through the spring of 66, comes out in May, and then you record this one in October, November to 66, and then came out in November as well. That kind of turnaround you just don't see in the record industry these days. Do you remember it taking a toll on you guys that kind of intensely go back in the studio or were you just riding so high with the success that you didn't even notice it? I think it's pretty delicious to tell you the truth. It was pretty hard. This is the last album that you guys recorded for Valiant. You had Jerry Yester, the new producer, Every Record Approach, but Jerry was, as opposed to Kurt's methods, Jerry seems, at least with his background, Simpatico, having played with the Modern Folk Quartet and replacing Zalyanovsky in The Spoonful, as well as, very noteworthily, producing Tim Buckley's second and third records, which are great. And I love his record with Judy Henske, Farewell, Aldebaran. Oh, yeah. That shit crazy. So the thing that stands out for me and that I'm conjecturing is this is kind of right before Jules left for India and you had a lot to do with this record. Your involvement was pretty intensive on this one, was it not? Yeah, it, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, Jerry and I were friends, as was Terry. We, we, were, we all came from the same little area of L.A., and we had known each other actually from Hawaii. And that's where I met Jerry. Terry was in Hawaii at the same time. It was just, you know, one of those things. So uh, it was easier to be involved in that end of the record making than it was with Kurt, although I was pals with Kurt, and I could wrap back and forth to him you know but but the real deep involvement was with with jerry actually i believe it was the same for all of us were you writing more at that time or oh yeah was it just that more songs of yours got chosen for the record no i was writing a whole lot more there's got to be some kind of link between what was gushing out of you and then you know you were leaving the country do you recall an actual conceptual tie no 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 there's no 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 tie there no tie whatsoever because i was had a spiritual practice going on as did several guys in the group and that was pretty much separate, except for the guys that were in Subud, and they involved Subud in picking our records, which was pretty right on the money. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> they, well, except well. they really wanted your own love, which, of course, did not do quite as well as the flip. So now, you know, when I look at the Monkees, another group that I love, you guys are very different. You guys were extremely proficient at your instruments. They were not. But it was all Wrecking Crew on the first one. Same with the Monkees. You know, then they put out Headquarters. And this, I kind of feel, is like your headquarters. I'll take that. <laughs> it's, it's basically you guys... Is it even augmented by Wrecking Crew? I think it is, but it's. I think a few of the people in the Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew wasn't really the Wrecking Crew at that time. I mean, that that was a bunch of people that played together, and they would get people from all over the place to play, but with maybe three or four, you know, basic guys, Hal Blaine, a few of the other guys like that. You yeah, know. Mike Deasy actually got a writing credit on one of your records. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mike. Oh, he was fun to play with and hang with. So he was a, you know, quickly in and out member of the band, practically recording-wise. And then Jim has said in the liner notes to the record that this and, uh, you know, the self-titled one from 69 was more representative of what the group actually was than most of the other records. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so do both of you guys feel that way? Did you ask me a question? Terry, are you on strike? Yeah, I was, I was just basically asking if it was just Jim Yester's feeling that this record and the self-titled one from 69 are more representative of what the band was than the rest of the records, or if it was just him thinking that. I thought that the idea of Renaissance and Jerry, etc., was I felt safer that we were keeping the integrity of the association. So the fact that Jerry had a strong foothold and roots in folk, you felt like Doug with the aesthetic choices you guys were making. Absolutely. There's something about the second album here that we're not mentioning. In the record business, if you pop an album with a hit or two off of it, the sophomore album is where people die, and we almost died. We weren't ready to record an album. You couldn't be. It was five months later. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. 
And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discograffiti and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discograffiti is an entirely listener-supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest, or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all. Discograffiti's the top 10. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discograffiti. I had a conversation with our group attorney one night in the 70s. He was in my house for a dinner party, and he asked me what I felt about groups. And at that time, he was the senior attorney at Motown Records. And I just I stood in my kitchen and I told him what I thought was wrong with the development of most acts in the record business. I never worked in the record business other than standing in front of a microphone and singing. And so he went back to work on that Monday and uh, told Iris Gordy at Motown uh, what I had said. And she called me up herself and asked to talk to me. And the next thing I knew, I was director of the creative department of Motown. The whole point is that you don't want to release a, a second album off of a first album that has hits. You don't want to release the, the first album until you have the second album already in the can. Because you're going to get caught up in your own hit-making fervor, which we were thrown out there, as opposed to sitting back and saying, holy shit, we got two good hits here. Let's dial it back in. Maybe with a major label, we would have been able to do that. Dial it back in, really nail the second album. Because the first album were all songs, with the exception of two, we're all songs we've been singing on stage for a year. But that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. You spend your whole life making the first album perfect. And Absolutely. Then, and then immediately and then, the record company wants... You just shot your what? Right. Okay. So not only are you starting from scratch, but they're making you do it within five months. But the key takeaway for me, and I'm on the outside looking in, Renaissance to me is not as good as the first one. But I think you guys totally pulled it off. And I think you completely dodged the sophomore slump curse. I thought that the second album came closer to making us an interesting group and a little, little less produced. Yeah, it feels more like a garage band, you know, in terms of the, the fervor behind it and the performances and the songwriting, I think, reflect that. Well, it also reminded me of 40 times and those first things that we released, which I thought were the most exciting records. Yeah. Well, let's drop the needle on this thing. So we kick off with I'm the One, which I love. Russ's vocal style is so forthright and aggressive. It's almost accusatory or sneering. It does not dovetail with the common idea of what the association are, which is one of the things I love about this. It has a real Nuggets garage spirit to it. And if you were to take away like, the really finely curated background vocals you guys are doing, this has the snarl and dismissive lyrical stance of a Nuggets tune under all that harmonic drapery. Interesting, interesting take you got there, yeah. Do you disagree? I'd love to know if you do. No, I mean, I'm, I'm chewing it up before I disagree with it. Let me put a little sauce on it for you. <laughs> I court contention. If you disagree, feel free to walk all over me. No, I, 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 I don't do that. I think before I speak, mostly. Wow, are you in the minority these days? Well, I've fucking learned it because I've spoken <laughs> I learned the hard way. Okay, so uh, then we have a yes or two in Memories of You, which is uh, incredible. I like this one a lot, and I don't mind this, but it does sound like a square dude taking a crack at a psychedelic song. Did I hit the nail on the head with that, or did I miss the mark? No, you mean Not like a what? In there. I missed the mark. All right. So he was the real deal as far as Lysurger, Inner Space Wanderer? Oh, absolutely. Was he? Okay. All right. Well, that's 
That's great to know. I think I'm going to revisit all his songs through a different lens now. <laughs> Terry, your recorder solo, typically spot on, duetting along with that guitar. It's another great one from you. I enjoyed playing recorder on our songs a lot. And I wish that I had had worked my way up with the other instruments that I could uh, pretend that I could play. No, no. It's interesting. Whenever you talk about your work with the recorder, because I listened to and read a bunch of interviews with you so as not to uh, ask the same jackass questions and you know you always downplay your work on the recorder which i find interesting because you're actually very good at it you may have picked it up and just effed around with it until you got some good sounds coming out of it but no i'd gotten a sound out of a recorder that other people weren't getting the recorder often what i played it at home or i played it wherever was instead of having a saxophone in my hand i had a recorder in my hand but i was trying to get more of a jazz tone more of a folk tone out of it often very melancholic than a black flota played by a bunch of Swiss kids. There's a real heartstring tugging sadness to a lot of your work on the recorder on those records. Well, I'm a sad guy. You're a tough nut to crack. A friend of mine a few years ago, independent artist, she asked me to come over and try to put recorder on a song she was doing, which I did. And as we got through, she says, every time you play recorder, you play it with fervor. And I hadn't really thought about that because it's not necessarily something I would want to do. Why wouldn't you want to? Well, the song doesn't call for fervor. I just wanted to be a part of the harmonics. The sad thing is that my fingertips, these fingertips right now, are numb, particularly my thumb. But I pick something up and I don't know that I've got it. It's probably carpal tunnel and they want to operate, but I, I ain't going under anybody's knife. They'd have to put me completely out to do it. But I can't play recorder anymore. Yeah. And it makes me so sad because I can't feel the holes. There's got to be a way for you to do it again if you really wanted to to because you know you talk about musical rehabilitation the drummer for Def Leppard lost an arm in a car accident and continued playing they figured out a way if you want to bad enough you could figure something out <laughs> that sounds like a Monty Python bit <laughs> <laughs> you coward <laughs> <laughs> So the next song on the record, I think, is one of your best songs, Terry. Wait, wait. About Terry's recorder playing? When we would go into cut, everybody would have an opinion of what everybody played. Well, you, that was pretty good, but, you, you know, you know, except Terry's playing. No one ever said, oh, I think you should play an F sharp instead of a C flat. That's how good he was. I mean, it was like, holy shit, he's the only one that didn't get chopped. That must have felt good, because what Yester was calling the hangings, if it was half as contentious as what it sounded like, that's really saying something. Yeah, that, that was really true. That was true. Yeah. I was the only one who said, okay, just go fucking play, you know? Yeah. So All Is Mine, I believe, is one of your best songs, Terry. It's a three, four time classic with gorgeous, pearl precise, almost churchy back with that perfect birdsy rhythm guitar and very underrated in your catalog. Did you feel like what you alluded to before about chasing that high of having the big hit? Was there any kind of drive inside you to try for another Cherish? I remember wondering if we had anything in the second album repertoire that was going to add up. When I heard Jules's demo of Heebie Jeebies, I sat back and I said, okay, we got one. And then we lost that little thing, that little, I don't know what it is. I mean, it was three of them singing. It was you, Jules, Jim, and Joe Ellen. And Joe Ellen. Yeah, that did the demo. Oh, you're saying from the translation of demo to studio recording, it lost a little something? Lots of songs get fucked over. Sure, because you're not replicating the feel. About that tune, I could not stand the mix on that tune it did just the opposite than what i wanted it to do and i thought everything was in the tracks but too late remember we didn't get to say shit about the mix that was somebody else's deal when you hear the song today you don't like it no wow so i would have mixed it different let me put it that way all the music is there does it make you wince when you hear it is it like that no no it's not wince worthy it's just like oh that, you know. <laughs> the size of the association the broadband that our sound was to be contain in we were too big for a lot of the tech level at the time yeah jules jim and joellen the three j's <laughs> <laughs> Jules and I were bump partners once in Texas, and they had local television on, and they had Los Tres Humbertos <laughs> were on in Dallas, you know. Uh, that, um, that, that, um, that, um, that, all fucking day long. <laughs> 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 
But that was it. That was the magic. That well, that was also the magic of folk music. Look, I have heard not just from you guys that the demo was better. I don't think I've heard the demo, but I have always loved this song. And you guys sound like true freaks here. Plus, you got to again dodge that sophomore slump bullet by man. Talk about not repeating yourself. And if someone else had written this, and I told you that the guy who wrote and sang it left for India a few months later, you would just shrug and say, yeah, of course. Of course, that's what happened. <laughs> You know, what it sounds like to me, listening to the lyrics, letting the music wash over me, is that you were overwhelmed by your own sense of empathy at the time. This is me just trying to connect dots. But you feeling all the pain in the universe, and it was driving you away from the band to follow a certain road. Is this the sort of opening trumpet blast of your trip to India? That was separate from the band. I can understand how you're looking at it, but that was a separate thing altogether. And also, in the spiritual path, the trip to India was this big right. compared to the rest of it. People think, oh, the trip to India, yo, you know, uh, uh, uh. uh-uh. You know, it's a dirty place, it's nasty. There's a lot of uh, tugi, the people that practice tugi there. There's a lot of crap there, man. But I liked it. It was, it was really cool. But there was no spiritual gain in going to India. There was a, a worldly gain because I, I got to look at a different part of the world that I never knew existed. I mean, uh, right in the middle of it, you know, standing in the middle of it and rubbing shoulders and tasting the taste and smelling the smells. I never realized how different a place could be. And that, to me, was more important than any alleged spiritual gain. To me, the first four songs are all great classics, I think. Angeline, man, Terry, you're going baritone on that one. And that's the two of you guys. Yeah. The two of you guys wrote that. Funny you should mention that one because on my computer, I've got Angeline. I've got I've got the track. And that's the song I go to. Okay, how's my sound system doing? Let me run the Angeline through it. And I say, oh, okay, yeah, I, mean, I got to change this, that, and the other. That's funny. But I listen to that almost every day. It's almost creepy. There's almost a creepiness to it. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Terry, you sound, you remind me of Otis Williams here from The Temptations. I mean, you're you're really going low for this one. Uh, I couldn't talk when I walked into the studio, and I couldn't talk 45 minutes before I recorded that. I had horrible laryngitis. Clark Burles took me into the next door studio, put a cup in front of my hand, and had me do an exercise that shook all of the crap off my vocal courts and he took about an hour prepping me and uh, for whatever reason I was up to sing that lead vocal and it was scheduled and they weren't going to bump the schedule I can't remember why that was as opposed to say why don't I come back in a couple of days and we'll see how to do so Clark from the high lows one of the one of the great vocal teacher mentor guru guys has me going like that for an hour and he gets through with me and kind of steers me to the studio goes over to jerry and says he's ready and he's got about 45 minutes plus you did do that one note harmony thing where it's like threading the needle with the one drone note that actually wound up being not just an exercise but an actual harmony that was utilized it's what's so fucking trippy about that song is that there is that one note you know the buddhist monks they would have the two voices that created that mysterious third voice it almost approaches that kind of territory that's like you're talking about pandora's golden heebie-jeebies now i do want to talk about uh briefly the next tune songs in the wind blue shell this holds the distinction as being the first song i don't like on an association record there aren't many of them this one's just a bit too sickly sweet for me i'm not really a fan you guys like that song i wasn't involved in much in the recording of that except for singing the background you know that was ted's thing for whatever it's worth it's just uh, i don't really connect with that one and i really don't like his vocal on it but uh i'm just some schmuck who sits in a chair listens to music so what does that matter well it really sounds like a sophomore album that song does what i'm saying is the quality of the song itself how it's developed 
I would certainly feel that way about Angeline. When it was suggested that we put it on the album, I said, really? Because it was like it was like maybe the first complete lyric I'd ever finished. The next one is just as weird. Another one by you and Jules. You may think. Oh, that's the one of the greatest songs ever written. <laughs> <laughs> See, where did the self-effacement go? It just went out the window. I'm curious, because it's more rocking than the material you typically try your hand at, Terry. Oh, it's more of a dope song. I mean, I, I always thought of it. All right, I'm not a musician, really, but that note that you hit at the end of each line? Yeah. That's the sweet spot, whatever that is. Yes, that's that's right. That's right. Yeah, that was a seventh or on the bottom or something like that. But that's what I'm talking about with, you know, staying away from attempting to repeat the formula. That's no formula. That chord that you guys consciously chose to put in that song is very weird. Yes, it is. And it just does not have its eye on the top 40, except for maybe coincidentally. If it were in the key of D, that would be a B flat. Na, 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 na. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm guessing it's not a song you return to live in 2023 very often. No, no, we, we, we don't do We never did that on stage, I think, anyway. Well, next month when I come and see you, I'm going to heckle you with all the fucking crazy. You fuck. <laughs> <laughs> make us laugh our asses off on stage <laughs> all right so i love you may think i think it's an amazing effort from you guys and then looking glass is one of my favorite songs that you've Ooh. written it's a perfect pairing with russ's vocal definitely one of his best vocals unquestionably so on point and then the recorder slash distorted guitar solo is a majestic pairing just a tinge of psych more accessible than you were i think seemingly allowing yourself to write around this time it seems like it has maybe a little bit more of a focus on connecting with the chart crowd you know there's some songs that you guys guys have and this one is a very very good example of what i'm talking about where even though i was born in 72 i feel like I, i'm there it's 1966 mm. i'm driving down you know i'm like in the canyon it's very strong uh it's a strong redolence of what i imagine to be that time on a quiet night is the most like that for me mm. yeah i know what you're talking about on a quiet night you know. Well, we'll get to that. That's the next record. But Looking Glass is, an, I think, an amazing accomplishment. Well, thank you, man. Did we do a second version of that with you singing lead, Jules? I don't remember. I have no idea. I don't think so. Because Russ is, it was, it was, he nailed it. No, I'm not talking about for the album later on. I don't think so. You had a song of that genre that I played the first time I ever played flute and horn with the group, but I can't remember what it was on a looking glass. Then Come To Me. I think it's great. It's very beatly. Yeah, uh, it is. And the vocal chorale, the round that you guys mm -hmm. did in the middle eight. Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> that's a great song. Jules, that's you with Jim, right? Yeah, I think so. And it's you singing along with Jim as well. So uh, then No Fair At All, which was the single along with Pandora's, very redolent of all the best parts of the Beatles' revolver. Huh. Woo. Just drony enough, but the pop sensibility is not at all drowned out. That's really interesting. And then No Fair At All is wonderful. A total yester showcase, written and sung. And I didn't know this, but it was inspired by the 1940s era song, Return to Paradise. Yes, Jim and I both love that the Return to Paradise tune. Okay. And we used to talk about that. And uh, yeah, right, exactly. That and uh, Adventures in Paradise, that TV show that it was in the 50s. I want to talk about your recorder work on No Fair at All, because Terry, when I actually think about you playing recorder, I don't think about Cherish. I think about this song. What I love about your work on this song, and what I think is so fucking funny, is that you're soloing through the entire song, and then you get an actual solo, too. You gotta love that. It's like you're playing through the whole song, then everyone stops playing so that you can showcase you, and then you keep playing. So that's nuts. And the warmth of your vocal blend on this one, I pictured as music to get pinned to. You know, my dad gave a pin to my mom. That kind of shit doesn't happen anymore. But, you know, if I was living during that time, I would want to make sure this song was playing when I presented the pin to my soon-to-be wife. Huh. I'd forgotten about pinning. That's true. This is one of your best songs, I think. You know, it wasn't a huge hit. It was in the Philippines. Yes, it was, it was. massive. It was one of the biggest songs that ever hit the Philippines. Really? 
Yeah. You know, only number 51 in the U.S., which is surprising. So that was January 67. Great song. Next one, another Jules Terry effort. You hear me call your name? A total rocker. It sounds like it was knocked out super quick in a good way, like in a Nuggets garage style kind of way. Feels like a strong eight miles high influence. Interesting. Interesting. The locomotive barrage of the drumming is completely killer on this song. When I say like you're not a singles band, you're an album band, you go past the obvious ones and most of the rest of the material is killer that's cool. really strong and then another time another place it feels like a nice little goodbye it feels like jules like you bidding the band farewell no no it was a real cute girl was it yeah see i try to picture it as a nice tidy story about a guy saying goodbye to his band that no that was that had nothing to do with it, it was nice, smoking nice too much story. dope dave you know, look when i smoke dope i don't go on mental journeys about how jules spends his time <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> For the past 40 years, Mike Stax's Ugly Things magazine has been bringing its readers in-depth stories about the greatest overlooked music of the 1960s and beyond. It's actually the longest-running independent rock and roll fanzine in the world. Ugly Things is now also a podcast. The Music Machine, Moby Grape, Love, Clear Light, Gabor Zabo, The Trogs, John's Children, The Velvet Underground, and more, all illuminated by exclusive interviews, conversations, and musical highlights. Like Discography, Ugly Things takes you deep into the music and the lives of the people who made it. Most podcasts are only skin deep. Ugly Things cuts to the bone. The Ugly Things Podcast. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so another time, another place. Do you really like music hall shuffle, like that kind of music style? Not particularly. I mean, yeah, it's good. It was definitely a thing for you guys, not just you guys, but anyone back in that time would dip a toe in music hall stuff. A lot of that was kind of justified by the Beatles using that kind of, you know, your mother should know or, you know, great songs, but also utilize that style. So here's my review of this. This one starts out super strong, but I think your quality control wobbles a tiny bit on side two. Actually, I don't think you guys really had any kind of a sophomore slump. This is like four months later. All right. It feels like they rush released it. I mean, because you were done in November. It came out in November. It's a one off because it's kind of the only super intensive Jules record. So it's kind of cool for that. And also it had to have been a very personal triumph for you guys to finally get your own instruments on the record. It has its own flavor in your catalog. I'm going to give it four stars. Oh, cool. Well, actually, the very first record we did, besides some guitar, uh, DC and, and a couple other guys, it was mostly us. With Brian playing that weird bass he played, Jesus Christ. It's so funny. He was a very strange bass player. <laughs> what do you give this one, Jules? Renaissance. Oh, I like it. I, I do like it. I'll give that between a three and a four, closer to four. So three and three quarters? Yeah, yeah. And then, Terry, how about you? I'm going to play the game, but I'm not comfortable with the process because I see it as not in its independent value, but I see it as if I were to walk into a retrospective of an artist and I'd see this and then it would go to that and then it would emerge as this and it would emerge as that. Look, I would never do this sort of format with you guys if I didn't love everything you did because it'd be too embarrassing. No, no, no. You don't have to go there. I would, I would give it a three with a bump. So three and a quarter? Three and a half. It's like we walked in and we did a demo of an album. Right. Uh -huh. Which, again, has its own flavor. And and you guys are telling me that, you know, you, you're losing things from the demo to the studio. Mm -hmm. Maybe a way to preserve some of that. But once again, these kind of albums, we were into an entirely new music. Thank God. No, but when you go back and you say, okay, here it is in relationship to what I think pop music is. Pop music hadn't, hadn't formed itself yet. Not in our genre. So one of the importances of the Suboot thing, as freaky as that was, is that Suboot was testing on singles. They tested on Good Vibrations. They tested on Hey Mr. Tambourine Man, Along Comes Mary, and one of the Steppenwolf, but I was, I was actually talking about the Mamas and the Papas. And they had no investment whatsoever in whether they liked the music or not. Quality of the music had nothing 
anything to do with anything. What would it be like for the Beach Boys to release this album? I was in a Wednesday night, little private West Hollywood apartment salon in which Brian Wilson and I were the featured people in there that these people wanted to host. And once a week, he was bringing us a piece of good vibrations. It would be like, I added this instrument. I added that to it. I got a rhythm guitar or whatever the add-on was. Six months in the making, we're rushing in and trying to figure out what, what we're going to do for an album in 40 days. But you got to stretch out. It took a little time, but you, you got there. No, it's part of the deal of being sponsored. Once you enter the realm where there are expectations attached to your art, I scheduled you for an album. Where's the album? Oh, you scheduled me to be really, really great fucking creative, okay? Hey, I'm scheduled to write a hit song. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I know you're on a soapbox about it at the moment, but as somebody who is constantly following his creative muse, having those kinds of restrictions as ridiculous and completely random as they are can produce great work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel in this particular instance, it did. <laughs> There's a cartoon about that. Somebody's asking somebody else, what's your greatest impetus? What's the greatest drive to get a piece of art? And he says, a deadline. You know, so... <laughs> My point is, we didn't know what our sound was. We had never heard us back. We had performed and performed and performed and performed and performed and performed. We never really sat down and heard us back. And it's like when you do a play, when I was taking my shots as an actor, you do a play and you get through it and you say, God, I wish I could see that. I wish I could see what I just did. They don't have dailies in theater. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't see myself the way you see me. I can't hear myself the way you see me. And if, and if I'm making a recipe and I like it, it's the stuff out of my kitchen and it's, it's to my taste. I don't know whether you're going to like it at all. I got to tell you, as a filmmaker, the last thing I'm going to do is show the actors the dailies because then they get self-conscious about the process you know the facial tics become mannered and rehearsed and you're trying to recapture moments that came completely spontaneously I'm, i don't completely disagree with you make a great record producer here I, I sing that no you can't hear it back <laughs> i'll yeah. tell you when you got it okay yeah yo know, i mean brian eno would just go ahead and fucking erase the song if he thought it sounded too much like who you were he mm -hmm. would He's done that and really pissed a lot of bands off. All right, I want to switch the focus here to Jules because there's a seismic shifting of plate tectonics in your life at this time. What was the impetus in April 67 for you to leave the band? I don't know if it was a sudden decision or whatnot to go study meditation in India. Well, it wasn't to go study meditation in India. That came during that time, but that, that was because there was an opportunity to go what happened with you during that time? Uh, was it so? Well, a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> Did Are you, you know, looking for a scoop? That's what it sounds like. It really looks like you're... I don't even know if it... Personally, within the structure of the band, went wrong and tell me. Mm, that's not the way I'm getting it. That's not the way I'm hitting that's it. Not, that's, that's not what I meant at all. You know, uh, there was a ton of stuff that happened, though. And you know what's interesting, Jules, from a modern perspective, let's say yeah. you were going through what the same feelings that you went through in 66, 67, except it was 2023. It's very possible, you know, because you're not the only guy to check out and go to india to search to go to the next level uh, but again going to india didn't have shit to do with it when i left the band because the thing i was into the type of meditation i was into says you don't have to go to india <laughs> it's not not important you know it's really not important but i had the opportunity because uh, i was looking at this uh, i don't know if you know the term satsang it's when everybody gets together and has a group of meditation and talk the woman that ran this satsang that i was going to got a deal with air india and we had a very inexpensive way to go so there's like 18 of us went in this satsang and this bunch of people you know and had that not happened, I wouldn't have gone. You know, I mean, I would, I could have afforded it, but I wouldn't have spent the money on that. Did you think because, you were just going to go for a few days and then you stayed, or did you? No, I was there for about three weeks, and then my wife, who I went with, and my daughter. My wife heard her back, so we had to get back so she could get that work done. I didn't actually know, but I, I figured from 67 to 69 you were in india so. oh no no i was only there three weeks maybe uh, close to four you know something like that did you want to be out of the band then or was it too i was out of the band then i think yeah i was out of the band yeah you were 
Did you start two new bands? You did Bijou and one other with Cyrus? or Cyrus Yeah, well, and all kinds of stuff happened. I'm just trying to remember it in a time sequence, which I'm terrible at, but I'll... <laughs> I had started two bands when I was out. I didn't know Bijou was at that time. I thought Bijou was the 70s. Bijou was at the Monterey Pop Festival. Hmm. No. There, that wasn't Bijou. What, what was the band you were in? Bottom the band with no name was the band I was with. Oh. Yeah, we were just, we were last. That's how come I don't remember it? I can't remember. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that was just a quick thing. We, we didn't know we were going to do that. I think it was Cyrus. It was friends with one of the guys who ran the thing. They said, hey, you guys want to come on? Said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Which we had three rehearsals. So I did not know that you were actually in the States. Oh, yeah. Oh, what? yeah. So did you want to be out of the band? What oh, yes, of course. That's why I quit. I wanted to be out of the band. Exactly. It was what? an overnight decision, actually. We were playing New York City. I don't know. We had played somewhere up in there. And I did not like the way the band was going. And I'm one person out of six. And that no matter what I would say, band's going to still keep going the way it goes. You know what I mean? I just, we were unfortunately, and I say that seriously, unfortunately, we were too much of a democracy. There was no one leading, you know, the one leading voice or two leading voices or something like that. Everybody had an equal say, so well, consequently turned to shit. When you do an artistic project, boy, that's a problem sometimes. Yeah, but you're liking these records. You're giving them high marks. Some of them, yeah, I like them. Some, but that's not the point, you know. How did you feel like the band should have been conducting themselves musically, where they currently were not? It was just the direction it was going. Something I felt wrong about it. I could not articulate what it was. And 55 years later, you still can't? No, I can't, and I don't care to. doesn't make any difference. It's so long ago. Who gives yeah, a shit, you know? I mean, if I don't give a shit, why do you give a shit? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because okay. these kinds of things, the entire listener base, you yeah. hear more than you'll ever understand. To me, when I get into a band, I'm buying into the whole thing. The story, the records. Yeah, yeah, okay. The unique arc of the band. I'm not obsessed with you, but... At the same time, the machinations that drove you to make certain decisions okay. at the time are just as important for me to understand as it is for me to parse your whole discography. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. I just can't help you very much. That's okay. I do understand where you come from. I didn't like the way the band was doing musically. I didn't like what was happening to the members of the band. Shoot, boy, we were going through some shit, man. We were on the road so much. I felt a lot of us lost our direction as human beings, including me. And I knew that something had to change. And the only thing that was big was the band. You know, I mean, boom. Okay, I had to go do something else and look at it from a different point of view. And of which I did. So you guys met each other in 62 and hatched this plan. So Terry, did it feel like a betrayal of any kind? Or were you just like, you know, Godspeed and keep in touch and let's hopefully hook back up at some future point? You ask me that question? Yeah, because you guys set this whole thing moving, the two of you. Well, if memory serves correct, Jules was kind of dismayed by me and angry at me, or I was having temper tantrums on one side and the other. I was not really happy with the road, and I really felt like we were being boxed in and channeled and taken over. I know there was one, I was throwing a shit fit at whatever the hotel was we stayed in in New York at the desk, and I turned around, and Jules and his wife were standing behind behind me. And that was about the last time I saw Jules. He left the group soon after that. We had a really shitty manager. Boy. We had a really good guy doing the best that he could. But in terms of business decision, he didn't have the chops to think about us. He was a good manager in terms of daily affairs, and he was not a manager of people. It wasn't until later that Carol Thompson told my ex-wife that there were good notices for me and reviews that he would take out of the common mix and put them in a separate file. So I don't know what else he did to the rest of the group, but we were being handled. I think that's the Yiddish application <laughs> of that would be. I've always assumed that I was one of the reasons that Jules left the band. Well, you among everybody else, man. I mean, you know... That was... Fuck you, I wanted to be special. Okay, okay. three and a half, four... <laughs> this is where bands break up. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is where bands break up. 
Bingo. I'm so grateful it didn't happen then because you guys had a lot of great work ahead of you. A lot of good stuff. We got back in. We were like, great. We're doing 250 days a year on the road, dude. Yeah, it's nuts. It sounds fatigued in the lyrics to Six Man Band with the drip dry. Uh, all yeah. that. <laughs> I do not remember the original lyric and I, I didn't have it. But the night that I demoed Six Man Band was at Gold Star. And Herb Hendler, who was a really personal friend, a family friend walks in with a couple of guys I think from Warner Brothers and it's just me and the engineer working on the lyrics to the song and he comes in and says hi Terry hi Herb <laughs> and he says we just came by to see your work in progress and I'm about to sing this song that says fuck you to all of the music people fucking up our careers. <laughs> and I had to change the lyric. I didn't have to. I thought this is going to be dead in the water with Warner Brothers or Beachwood if I don't change this lyric. And so I changed it. But originally it said, you think, but your whole career is written in your stars, meaning it's us, the stars that they're handling. That was the gist of my fuck you to them. I have a lot of fuck yous. I'll do a special show with you sometime. And, uh, yep, you know. <laughs> that sounds like that should be a regular TV show. Fuck you. I would definitely take you up on that. There's no question. You would probably like to appear on another show that uh, I do a bunch of Patreon shows because I do three shows a week. And one show I'm going to start doing is called Kids Are Just Dumb Adults. <laughs> I haven't started it yet, but it's going to be me with someone who's 18 or younger doing a debate back and forth about how shitty whatever song we're covering that they like. From All right. Yeah. I want to do a show that's titled, What the Fuck Were You Thinking? If that doesn't exist yet, it needs to immediately. And we're going to see clips of your movie, hear, hear samples of your songs, and we're going to ask you, what the fuck were you thinking? Right. Yeah, 99% of today's music. Not just as I, the entire listener base of discography. The nature of the band changes inexorably now because yeah. you leave and then Larry Ramos comes in. We were talking about when I left and in India and all that sort of stuff. And that time when I left, I started uh, two bands, okay? One was called Joshua Fox and one was called Bijou. Bijou was the first one that I had started. And that was with Russ. Russ had left the band also for whatever reason. I don't know. But anyway, we started this band. It was uh, two wonderful women singers, Three guys and myself, okay? Well, the, the female singers are from Honey Limited, which... Yeah, Joan and Alex Sliwin. Their record's fantastic. Oh, they are some of the best singers. Uh, we had got a tentative contract with A&M, but a &M dropped us along with about six other bands, okay? So that was the long story there. Don't even know why they did it. Have an idea. But anyway, they dropped us along with these other bands. And then... Not too long after that, I started a band called Joshua Fox. And uh, Joshua Fox was a band with these three guys that came down from uh, Northern California. Okay, they just come to L.A. One of the guys was Michael Botts, who was the drummer in the Eagles, I believe, or something like that. He, you know, he died well, years ago. But it was during that band that I figured out what the fuck I was doing, which was trying to recreate the association. Really? Yeah, in, in a sense, you know. Because uh, Bijou, the stuff I've heard from Bijou is a whole different musical universe. So you're oh, saying, yeah, that was that was really good. I mean, there's really? stuff going on there. So Joshua Fox is more of a clowning attempt. It was just about one, two, three, four of us, I think. And it was really more rock and rolly. But I was trying to put that vocal thing into it and we couldn't do it. And I thought, well, what the fuck am I doing? I should go back in the association. I mean, it just hit me. I said, okay. Next day, I went down and said, hey, guys, I want to be back. That's two years later. Okay, so it feels like the idea with Ramos coming into the picture. Yeah. With Jerry Yester, you get somebody who dovetails with your vision. This guy had sung with the new Christy Minstrels and actually wound up singing on two of your biggest hits. I'm oh, with. yeah, he's an incredibly good singer, good musician, and that's as far as it goes. It was not the first choice. Not the first choice? Who was? Who was the first choice? The first person I asked was Mike Brewer. Brewer and Shipley. Oh, cool. Man, that would have driven you down the freak lane a little bit quicker. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So when you say, Jules, and that's it, nothing more, you just didn't hit it off? Or? No, he, he came from a completely different... <sighs> 
ethos, I guess you could say. He has been show business since he was a little kid, okay? And his take on show business was not our take on show business. We were basically all these guys that put it together, so on and so forth, when we were almost adults already. He was on Broadway for years and years and years, The King and I. He was in that. He's one of the kids. And he came from a very standard showbiz approach. This whole crap that is, and that's where he came from. He would dress uh, to the nines just to get from one gig to the other. And we we say, oh man, come on, let's go. Who's got the dope? You know, that that kind of thing. Well, Jim said that Jules really inspired the avant-garde side of us. Larry was much more pop and R&B oriented. So I think that side probably came out a little more. Yeah, it was complete two different approaches. Terry, did you find it an ill-fitting suit? I just started talking about that recently with Jules. Never had the opportunity ever to sit down with the rest of the members of the band. There was nothing wrong with Larry's art. Nothing. Really professional, very knowledgeable, great technique. Super slick and not in a cloying kind of way. Right, exactly. He wasn't the association. That wasn't the dish that we were putting on the table. And we became this different thing. It's like a recipe. It's very aggressive. There's a difference between assertion and aggressive. He gave you the illusion of being simply assertive. And and I would look back in 2020 on hindsight and say he was very good at being subliminally aggressive. And he was looking for an identity. I don't want to trash Larry Ramos at all because I say this in all faith. I'm the one who asked him. Mm-hmm. In Mike Whalen's recording session of a Jimmy Webb tune. There, that's all the names you can drop. <laughs> and all the people who had just left the Crunchy Munchies, the Christy Minstrels, was in Studio 3 that I asked him. And he was there with Helen. They had all just quit the Christies. And I'm sitting there and I just turned around and said, Tenor, <laughs> Tenor, known Tenor, pick up music really fast. You want to sing in the group? Oh, okay, look, look, good, boom, there, we're done. Pat Kalecha was there. And I was, you know, in about six months, I was really sorry. It's like you start dating somebody, and it seems like a really good idea, or any any work thing. It had to be his style. And there wasn't anything wrong with his style, and a lot of his style is what we needed to have. It was like in the wrong doses. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. The thing that always bothered me about the association is we never had a dance beat, I don't think, to more than about six of the songs out of about 45 that we ever recorded. We weren't a danceable thing, and our tempos, I don't know where how Blaine sat, but I was approving it, as everybody else was. But our tempos were up out of that groove and toward the front of the beat, and mm-hmm. you didn't get what I loved was they call fat back on the very, very last edge of the beat. And like Keltner would play, like Mike Botts would play with Jules. He was the Righteous Brothers drummer for a long time. Then he was he was in bread, but it couldn't settle. And then Larry went off and started making his own music. And there was nothing wrong with the music that he was making with his one partner, Bob Alcivar. Mm-hmm. They were making really well crafted songs with brass big productions like that. I don't remember ever being in the studio when any of those tracks were recorded. I think he did some stunning work with you guys. I totally understand. He did stunning work. It wasn't ours and it wouldn't get played because it didn't sound like ours. There's nothing wrong with what he did. I go back and I listen to this and I say, if you had taken that and put it over here aside on its own and done a whole fucking album of that level of work, Larry would have been a star. He could have been a star all on his own. You get a band that's that big. I mean, you guys started from a, basically more of a collective than a band. It's almost literally an association. You have like 15 guys. There's going to be personality types that don't blend. It's inevitable unless you were to do a Meyer Briggs test beforehand to make sure everyone's on the same page. But, you know, you made a spur of the moment decision that at least, you know, had some objective musical gain for you to bring into the band. It might not have been the same character as the initial band. Well, if you're going to argue that point, then I succeed, okay? No, no, no. I'm just... No, go go ahead. I, I don't mean this in a passing graphic context. I say, and then you rebut, and you're telling me my version of what it was. So let's just leave it at that. Larry joined the group, and the group became that. And then Jules came back, and we started 
to get footing once again in a context that was more in keeping with the original association. And I think that Jules's relationship with the poet's name, please, Jules, that you co-wrote songs with. Errol Carmel? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Errol, we both wrote with Errol. I just want to let you know, I, w- I wasn't trying to argue your feelings about it. I just wanted to shine a light of positivity on what might have been a frustrating experience, just from an outsider's perspective. But your feelings are your feelings. Wasn't looking. Oh. <laughs> really. Thank you. Thank no, you. My feelings are my feelings. I, no, my intention was You're, not. Uh, you know, AA quotation, your feelings are not facts. Okay. I wasn't arguing with you. You were, I felt you were arguing with me. I was not bagging on Larry's music at all. I thought yeah. it was brilliantly done, and neither I nor my management nor the record company, Warner Brothers, thought that that music per se found a proper place in the association albums. Warner Brothers didn't think so, okay? I'm not arguing against Larry's music, and I'm very, very careful to say he was an astounding professional guy. Oh, yeah. Well, now we're at Monterey Pop, which I know you guys have a viewpoint that not a lot of people have about the festival because, you know, you were the first band to play at the first festival that ever was. So Mm -hmm. you guys kicked off the festival era which is insane to think about. All right, so June 16, 1967, you guys become the first act to ever play at a rock festival, pop rock festival, Monterey Pop. Now, you have very specific views on your performance and how you were treated. I know you felt like you were thrown to the lions and you are not happy with the result, as it turns out. We had just come out of the studio. We had just come out of recording Never My Love, Requiem for the Masses, and that album. So the footage that exists that I see of you guys playing the machine and a It was an embarrassing mistake. Somewhere in there, we were all tone deaf. Having never had a festival like that before, we simply addressed it as, okay, we're out of the studio. Uh, Can our wives go up there? Okay, you're flying us up privately. Okay, we fly up and then we stink and the wives go. Everybody got all that going on. And all we know is that we're coming out of the studio. What are we going to wear? Let's wear suits. Okay, let's go up there and let's do this show and come home. And you get there and you go, it's like being in to a party where you got the wrong dress code. John Phillips, they really fucked over some people in that festival. Uh, Laura Neuer almost committed suicide. They got her on acid and just pushed her out on the stage. I believe you guys are in the extras, the DVD extras. <clears throat> and of course, it's available on YouTube. You're not your entire performance. I think it's just two songs. I love it. There's a rawness to your performance that is not on the talk shows. The television shows were all lip sync, with the exception of uh, Ed Sullivan. Everything else is lip sync. There's no difference in your singing ever, 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 ever. It's what costume you're wearing or what the, where they want you to stand. My argument again, and, and I don't think I ever tout my own shit. I really try not to. Had we performed Requiem for the Masses at the Monterey Pop Festival, our career would have had a whole different slant to it. Had we performed the song that we already had in the can, which was Requiem for the Masses, had we performed Requiem for the Masses at the Monterey Pop Festival, our career would have been different. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And could not have said they are irrelevant. And right about that time, we were starting, and for about four more ideas about single releases, we were beginning to dial ourselves or collude with being guided into irrelevance as far as program directors were concerned. Okay, so Bones how? This was not a decision that you guys made, right? As a producer, as somebody who was pushing you in that direction. He wasn't a producer yet. He was an engineer. So your manager really loved the first Mamas and Papas record and pushed you in Bones Howe's direction, right? Oh, well, Water Brothers did. May have been Pat. I'm sorry. Yeah. The first fruits of the pairing uh, was Wendy, which on July 1st, 1967. Yeah. Right? Back dab in the center of the summer of love. It's hard to be facing irrelevance as far as musical stylings go if you are at the top of the charts for the most fertile time in the history of music. You guys are at the top of the hill. Now, before we even say anything about that, I'm letting Ruth in. Hello? You got me? Yes, ma'am. You don't have to put me on screen. I don't have any makeup on. <laughs> 
Harry's only wearing rouge and mascara right now. Hey, Hi, Ruthann. How you doing, man? You're looking pretty, good. I'm pretty good. When was the last time the three of you were, were together in one room? Two years oh. ago. Oh, good. Oh, years and years. I've been in a room with Jules a few times, I think, and Terry a couple of times. So we just got to July 1st, 1967, and I'm going to do an intro for you and just bring you in and we'll just talk about Wendy, talk about that time, the, your relationship with the guys here. You know, we were just talking about Bones How and the very first fruits of the pairing with the notoriously difficult to please as far as producers producers go, banned the association. Bones had his time up at bat. He brought Wendy to the table. It topped the Billboard charts on July 1st, 1967, stayed there for four consecutive weeks, smack dab in the center of the summer of love, which brings us to our super secret special guest. Our surprise guest was born in the Bronx, moved to California with her family, but felt isolated with few friends, so she started playing guitar in her room. And thank Christ for those turn of events, since her first <laughs> song, her very first song gained her a spot on the television talent show, Rocket to Stardom, when she was only 12. While still in high school, she started playing Hoot Nights at the Troubadour, which sounds like the type of night that would never occur in 2023. Her friendship with Van Dyke Parks begat an introduction to the association, who recorded her song, Windy, in 60. She wrote the song apparently in 22 minutes while living in an apartment in David Crosby's house, and it was number one for four weeks solid. Lads and ladies, give it up for the absolutely astoundingly great Ruth Ann Friedman. Yeah! <laughs> You're funny. That's a lot to live up to. I don't know if I can do that, but I was really fortunate to have Van Dyke introduce me to the association and for Jules and Jimmy to be generous enough to uh, give me a place to live for a while when I turned 21 in, in your house. You know that, Jules? Oh, gee, I didn't know that. Yeah, I got very drunk and had a hard time making it home, <laughs> not being a drinker. But Christ had nothing to do with it, I don't think. Um, yeah, that's Jewish, what I was thinking, you know? too. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, Ruth Ann, be honest, you're like a nice Jewish girl. Are your parents just wringing their hands thinking, oh, my God, she's living in sin with a seven-man band? Well, I wasn't living in sin with them. Well, it was uh, a six-man band, so let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ramos was not in there yet. No, this was the very beginnings from, of the beginning, huh? Long from that, yeah, mm -hmm. boy. We had such a yeah. fun time. I'm telling you, it was really fun. How long did you live with the band? I don't know. And it was just the two guys. I didn't live with the whole band. I mean, that sounds really obscene. No, those two guys, and they were just wonderful to me and let me stay there. I have often relied on the kindness of strangers, <laughs> as uh, Tennessee Williams so aptly wrote. You've served yeah. some of the most legendary couches that ever were. We had some fun times. We took a lot of weird drugs. Pretty weird stuff, some of it. I don't know if you remember Cyclol. What is we that? We got it from Van Dyke. What, is what was his name? The dealer, Fat Somebody, the dealer had it. Oh, Eli. Uh, what? Eli, Fat Eli. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was our uh, Dr. What with the Beatles guys? Dr. Dr. Robert. They had Dr. Roberts. We had Fat Eli. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember taking this particular weird drug one time and um, trying to play guitar, but you couldn't because the steel strings, instead of twang, they went thud. And just at that moment, Donovan came by, <laughs> somebody who was squiring him around Los Angeles brought him to your house and I tried to play a song for him and I couldn't. That's a story of the great fortune other than Wendy in my life. <laughs> it seems so. like if there's one person that you could be playing a song to where you kind of collapse in psychedelic confusion, the most empathetic person you could be playing it for would be Donovan. Maybe, but he was off and on his way and that was okay. You know, an endlessly interesting aspect of this story of your fortunes colliding is 
says to me anyway that you know your catalog Ruthann is littered with beautiful examples of a very certain kind of music of which the association seemingly has absolutely nothing to do with so for you to have generated a song like Wendy which is kind of outside your your wheelhouse and then for it to have worked out as it did was it as <laughs> surprising to you as I would imagine it would have been I don't know after along comes Mary would not seem to be the kind of song that would be in their wheelhouse True. if you think about it it's like a hip-hop song yeah. it's like the first hip-hop song you think well, i used to play it and i play it as a jazz waltz so i thought of it differently i guess it could be a lot of things yeah well i just mean the rapidity of the lyrical template yes you played it as a three-quarter waltz yes every time i think that i'm the only one is lonely wow wow that's cool. <laughs> so whose idea was it when Wendy was written that, holy shit, this would be a perfect next hit for the association? People have all kinds of weird stories about how Wendy got to the association. Chuck K has a fantasy that he took it to them, but I took it to him and asked him to record it, uh, to publish it, because the association's going to record this, will you publish it for me? So his story is not true. And then some other people think Kurt Betcher got it to them. But what happened was, I do believe it was Joellen Yester. She says it was, and I can believe her. She called me asking me if I had any material, and I had just written Wendy. Beyond that, I don't know what happened. And within a week, you guys had recorded it. When you had written the song, Ruthann, did you know this has hit written all over it? Or did you no, think? No, not at all. My musical business instinct doesn't exist. Still doesn't exist. I have no idea. Ruthann? Yeah? Could you sing Wendy the way that it came out in the hour that you wrote it in? The demo of it. Can you do it live right now? Right now? Okay. Yeah. Who's peeking out from under a stairway, calling the name, it's lighter than air. It's the same way they did it, is only it? the beat yeah, is the 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 not too. hard. It's almost the same tempo. It's just a little bit slower than we did it. Yeah, but without the beat, yeah. without the boom, 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 without that. The didn't have that rocky beat, which you guys put to it. Well, to I, I originally remembered that it had a lilt to it, almost like a yeah. three for who's trip and down the streets, but I'm totally wrong. That's my senior moment. I don't know. It was just a folky song. It was more of a folky song. You guys turned it into a rock song. Whenever it comes to that boom, 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 boom moment, when I'm performing it with my Jewish space laser band, mm -hmm. I just raise my hand up and the silence for those beats and then we come back and everybody laughs. It makes the song, th those beats. It, it brings you in, doesn't it? It does. I also like the chord under the word eyes. It's an unresolved, it's, is it a suspended chord? I'm not a musician. I don't know. They're pretty basic chords. Jules would know better than me. Well, we sing it in D and that's a D. Something. It's just a pure D chord. It's a D major seven. Sorry. Right. So it's okay. got some unresolved. Sorry. I, I think. I did it as an A chord, so you guys transposed it. Yeah. You know, yeah. except for the Idrisi brothers, it feels like all of your outside songwriters were writing, or at least their work was redolent of drugs. <laughs> Along comes Mary, you know, obvious marijuana song. This is Acid. It's like your... Or LSD. Yeah, yeah. A lot of drug songs. I wish you guys had hung in there through the 70s so I could have had your concept album about Quaaludes. <laughs> oh, God. I don't know. <laughs> That was, that was a problem for a while, I must admit. Definitely a problem. Quaaludes and, and cocaine. Ruthann, how are you yep. celebrating your success? Because in the spring of 67, your fortunes had to have been a hell of a lot different than they were in the summer. So the flower girl waif who was being blown from couch to couch, how did your life change? Okay, I will tell you that I was never a flower girl. I think that the guys will attest to that. Okay. No, um, never. I was never a flower child. Never thought of myself as a flower child in any way, shape, or form. I thought of myself as a chubby Jewish folk singing girl, and that was my genre. <laughs> there were there were several of us, <laughs> and uh, you know, I had no, I didn't ever feel like I was part of um, that particular movement, but I did take a lot of acid and other weird psychotropic drugs. But I was never dancing naked in the park with the uh, flower children. 
Okay, so the record having been set straight, how did that song change your life? You know my song that's on the Chinatown album? <laughs> it was not what I planned, so I ran away and joined a rock and roll band, which is what I did. Did the song's success make you afraid? It, it wasn't... <sighs> I didn't feel that I was going to be able to make it as a solo artist. I did not see that in my future. I didn't see it until a couple of years later that it was even possible. So I called Yorma Kalkinen and said, can you recommend a guitarist? I need to make a band. And he, of course, being a good brother, sent me his brother, Peter, <laughs> who is a great guitarist and yeah. still is, and a, a fine songwriter uh, as well. And so I ran away and joined a rock and roll band. I couldn't deal with the uh, music business in LA. Somehow I managed to never get an agent or a manager, although David Anderley did at one point want to take over my career, but Steve Clark wouldn't let Remember Steve Clark from Atlanta, guys? Yeah, oh my Two gosh. Yeah, he was with Kurt for a while. Kurt was with him. I was with him. Oh, I um, didn't know that. Yes, he, he ha had most of his meetings at the top of the office building on the corner of Sunset oh, and Vine, I think it was. Yeah, and the, at the very there. top, there was the bar at the top, and that's where... <laughs> He lived primarily within the bar. I think that did him in. When you think yeah. back to that time, was it a harried one for you that you weren't able to fully enjoy because of how intense the whole experience was? I couldn't enjoy a whole lot of anything because I was just an unhappy, neurotic, depressed person. None of it made any sense. I didn't know how to negotiate anything. I was a successful as far as making money went. Thank you, guys. I don't know if I would have survived if it hadn't been for Wendy. I don't know if the band would have survived if it hadn't been for Wendy. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. You guys were doing pretty good. I think you were doing just fine. And you would have done just fine. Your sound is just so amazing. And rightly or wrongly, I attribute that sound to you, Jules. I think really? that I always have. I always thought that it was that is your sound that created the association. Those were your harmonies that you did. And it was different from anybody else's. It was different from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. It was different from Brian Wilson. It was yeah. your sound. That's what I've always thought. I have to tell you one of the songs. Do you ever hear that song of mine? I told you her. You make some changes in me. Okay, that was all you. You did that one for me. I said, oh, God. This is for Ruth Ann. You were the one that gave me the hoo-ha on that one, man. I'm honored. I smell a Nancy and Lee collaboration going on here. Oh, yeah. I, we'll go for that. I would. We're we're just challenged by Miles. Well, when are you coming to L.A. again, Jules? I'm going to come out pretty quick. That's so funny because Ruth Ann and I had just talked. I told her some of my past that she didn't know about. She told me some of her past. We said, hey, we got to get together and talk about yeah, this. Yeah, let's get together. Jesus. Yeah. And if the yeah. two of you guys could get something rolling. We're Coke. talking over 50 years, babe. Yeah, I know. And then coax the guy in the middle there to come out of retirement. Well, how are you feeling, Terry? I'm pretty good, thank you. Oh. All the things that I still have work. <laughs> oh, excellent. excellent. Then you didn't need the other parts. <laughs> no, but I'm really inspired by your 1,100-step walk. In the, yeah, uh, really. On oh, that's the beach only every the day. Walk. I had to walk back another 1,100 steps. I know. We have a saying in recovery, 20 miles in, 20 miles out. Well, I'm working on it. Can I talk about the recording of Wendy? Sure, of course. Bones came on, and all of a sudden, as was the way Pat Coleccio would give in to anybody, it happened twice. We get a phone call, we're going out on tour, and we get a phone call that says, you're in the studio tomorrow night, Warner Brothers wants a taste of the new album that we have hadn't begun. We hadn't selected anything. We were maybe two months away from coming into the studio to record an album. And the song that came up was Windy. And we were going to meet with Clark Burroughs as soon as he had basic tracks to work with. The bass player Ray Pullman. They call Ray up and say, uh, write some charts for this. And he started recording tracks at noon. And we started rehearsing 
rehearsing to those tracks about three or four or five o'clock. Russ and Larry went in and sang the lead vocal, and Clark Burroughs was writing charts for us as it was all going down. So rather than rehearsing the song, we were doing the first 16 bars and then the second 16 bars, so that we'd overdub them and we'd go like that. Woo-hoo! What began at noon ended at sunrise the next morning and we got in our cars and went straight to the airport and went to Virginia. By the end of the song, everybody was singing mm-hmm. on the on the record. Judy Hensky, Ruth Ann. But I don't remember what time it was. At the time, it wasn't, you know, day or night. Well, when we were getting to the last choruses, the repeat of the choruses. You can hear Ruth Ann very clearly in the tag. That's one of my favorite things about the ending of that song is that Ruth Ann is very clearly audible. Ruth Ann, <laughs> Jill Mullen, Yester, Judy Hensky, everybody's voices was going. So we flipped the, the baritones could sing, falsetto and the tenors could come down to. That was all in overdubs. But I'm standing back by the booth while something else was being sung. And Pat Coleccio says, what do you think? And we're hearing the real gist of the song. And I was so exhausted. And I said, I don't know, Pat. It doesn't sound like the song that Ruth Ann wrote to me in my <laughs> ear at the time. And I was very, very fearful for where the association was going to go beat-wise. Mm-hmm because this was going to be popped as a single. And to me, at the time, it had a... I thought, well, it's danceable. I'm not sure it's exactly the groove I would have. But anyway, that's all burnt ears, burnt head, everything, right? I turned to Pat and I said, I don't know, but I'm going to bet you, and he was seriously a gambling man, (laughs) that if they release it, and I can't remember whether I said six or seven weeks, I said, but if they release it, it's going to be number one in six weeks. And it was to the day. (laughs) Wow. Just get that puppy out there. The right time of year. I mean, when you think about the summer of love, or at least what I do, like the first cursory thought I have is Sgt. Pepper and Wendy. Yeah. That was the summer of love as far as the charts went. The only time my recorder playing was not done by me, it was done by Bud Shank on Piccolo, the same oh. guy that plays for the mamas and papas. Yeah, he did play. the flute solo on California Dream. If you're going to be replaced by anybody, it's, it's an honor to be replaced by him. I wasn't there when the instrument sweetening tracks were done. Did but you- once again, it's one of those things, shovel it in, set it on fire, now get out of here. Um, Your memory is amazing. I remember bits and pieces. I have had that much brain damage, I guess, over the years. But I do remember being called to come in and sing on it because it's going to be a hit. (laughs) I remember that call. Come in. We're releasing it. It sounds great. Come in and sing on it. And I felt so, wow, thank you. What an honor. But I must admit, I did want to funk it up a little. And that's why I put that blues lick in at the very end. That was my funking it up a little. It's truly the cherry on the cake is listening for your voice at the end. I want to ask a question from one of our esteemed listeners, the discography soldier of sound who Ruth Ann knows very well. Willie Aaron had a question he wanted. I to- love Willie. Willie's the greatest, yes. a true mensch. So Willie wants to know, and this is a guy who uh, Ruth Ann plays with all the time. Were you guys afraid of how you'd be received at the Monterey Pop Festival? That's one part of the question. Did you conceive your albums as just a collection of songs, or were they conscious of making a thematic statement? And did you think Birthday, the LP, was a major achievement for the band? Again, the first one is, were you afraid of how you'd be received at Monterey? Terry, were you afraid of how you'd be received? I don't think so. I think afterwards, I didn't know that you were going to be asked to roller skate on a fast track. I saw the lineup. It just it never occurred to us. We were right out of the studio, you know, 40 days into an album, your brain doesn't work anymore. And yeah, let's go up. Monterey, great. Take the wife. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think about it too much. You know, history's being made. 
I didn't think about it too much because we had hits. I felt safe. Right. And it wasn't until afterwards that you went, whoa, we're not being invited back to the party. I mean, what the fuck was that? None of the way no. that Monterey was presented to the people who performed there about where the money was going to go, who you were singing for. We weren't singing for fame and riches. We were singing for the legalization of marijuana. That was the fundraiser. So it wasn't like you're going to go out and sing at this festival and you're going to participate participate in, in a social conscience context, and it never really occurred to us that we were going to be uh, that judged, that categorized, that, you know, you're in, you're out. Right, right. Awesome. That money did not go where it was supposed to go. Now, did you... <laughs> did ever? Right. Bangladesh was a notorious screw job. Who Adler bought Ocean Park after that. Go figure. So did you actually conceive of your albums as... Did you think of them as having a thematic statement no okay and did you think birthday was a major achievement for the band yes but while birthday remained for years among the fans birthday remained between it and the Stonehenge album as the two favorite albums from the association, although there was no big breakout hit from Birthday. Bones Howe mixed the shit out of that album. People walked in, wives, friends like that, walked in the studios, we were listening back to things, and started crying. I cried. Yeah. There was a sound that Al Savar got that I always thought was Bill Holman. Bill pulled me aside at the Musicians Union one day and says, you keep congratulating me for that. I didn't write a note. I was simply the contractor for what Al Savar told me to do. There was a voicing in there that... <sighs> Voicing's the whole thing. When when you get into harmonics, you can have all these notes played by the same thing, but if you move this down here and move that over here and move that over there, it changes the whole context. For example, that's what happened with Pandora's Gold and Heebie Jeebies. You lose that essence, and, and sometimes people can't figure out what the essence is. You don't get whether you're hearing an overtone, whether you're hearing a complementary harmonics, whatever the deal is. But that, uh -huh. Da, 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 da. That register with flugelhorns, French horn, tubas, which is the Mozart tuba. It's a little rotary valve conical mouthpiece. It's like a French horn set up straight like a baritone horn. That was underneath the voices. So Al Savar knew that it was absolutely going to mirror the register and the sound that, that he was getting from us. And in the studio, it was astonishing. I felt like we had gone into one of those old TV shows where you show up looking this way and they do a complete makeover on you. Right, right. You know, it took all the emphasis off of the tenors being the featured voice in terms of the payoff. And it flipped it over into the lower registers. It was an astonishing experience. And then we got back and we heard Bones' mix. He spent $60,000 thousand dollars mixing that album that was our budget that was our in studio budget well so before we get into the record now we're moving forward in history and we've already done a, a massive sprawling interview with ruth ann so we're going to move into inside out and i don't think uh, ruth ann has any more involvement with the record right no i have no i'm Baldwin passed Wendy. Then I went up north and got lost in my own history. And these guys went on to have a spectacular uh, success. Everyone listening out there, Ruthann, way beyond Wendy, has an astounding story and an incredible career. And you can hear the whole thing on her own standalone episode. And I definitely recommend that you head over there as soon as you're done with this episode. I have a question I want to ask you, Ruth Ed, before you depart. Okay. Were you involved with Van Dyke when he gave Scruggs the cat Robotussin? No. Okay. What happened to but the cat? Before I go, oh, you can cut this out if you want. Willie Aaron is one hell of a keyboardist, besides being a good question asker, and an astonishing ear and a great keyboardist, and is one of my Jewish Space Laser Core Band members. That's mm -hmm. all I have to say about that. He is literally one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Yes. Talk yeah. about Van Dyke. I'm talking about Willie Aaron. Van Dyke is a gentleman. He's a Southern gentleman, and if you could say anything bad about about him, I want to hear it. Never heard anybody <laughs> say anything bad about Van Dyke. I really haven't. <laughs> 
You try to think of something now, and I can't come up with anything. <laughs> uh, something about his bib coveralls. Oh, <laughs> he has his own style as well. Now you can't right. put him all down for that. Yes. <laughs> he's had his share of troubles. Let me tell you, he built a house in the Hollywood Hills and it burned down. Oh, you know? yes. He's paid his dues some. He's a, a gentleman and a scholar. All of those things. Anyways, I love you guys. I love you, love too. you too, I'm Glad you're still with us. And Jules, Thank you. when you come to LA, I'll make you a dinner. I will do it with my own hand. Oh, I'm gonna draw a picture for you. See you, Ruth Ann. Have fun, guys. Love you. Keep walking. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ruth Ann just got a new hip. She's walking eleven hundred steps out and eleven hundred steps back every day. On the- I see what you and Ruth Ann are up to every day. All right, so moving forward now, Insight Out comes out in 1967. This one shoots closer to the top of the charts. We're at number eight. Uh, comes out June 8th, 1967. And Never My Love, which is truly my first whoa from you guys, like when I was a kid, that becomes a massive success. It goes to number two in Billboard in October 67. Written by the Idrisi brothers, who'd already gone to bat for you guys, but didn't hit it out of the park quite like this. And now, just like the monkeys when when Pisces Aquarius, Capricorn and Jones was done. They're playing their own instruments, but just like them, you guys are being augmented by the Wrecking Crew. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. The first record is basically a Wrecking Crew album instrumentally. The second album is you guys taking the reins back. And then the third album now is kind of the best of both worlds. The bedrock is the band playing, but then you have these spices in the ingredient list. You're able to use Hal and Larry Nectal, Bud Shank, Mike Deasy, etc. Did you feel like that was a compromise to bring them back in or a natural evolution in terms of being able to ask for help or you felt you needed it? There's a piece of this that's missing in the play. Jerry Yester began the third album so that Requiem was already in the can with a lot of horn. We did it in New York. A lot of people don't know this part of your story, so let's give people context. Tell me if I get this wrong. Bones had a piece of the publishing on Requiem, so he wanted to overtake your record and put this thing on the whole side. Bones had a piece of the publishing on Requiem? In my research, that's what I came across. That he well, would- call your researcher up and- and sue him. I'm only one guy and I'm doing my best. You need help. I need a lot of help. You need help. I'm looking uh, for that help. That's where I'm going wrong. It's like an Andy Warhol interview on local television here in LA where he had just come out at the peak of his career and he's got on his mirrored sunglasses and he's got one of those women hanging on his arm and he's leaning <laughs> against a wall. And the interviewer asked him a really, really serious question question about art and warhol doesn't respond at all nothing changes in his face finally he says after like a seven second eternity on air pause you asked that question wrong (laughs) that was the end of the interview Uh, so no jerry esther continued on as our producer we were doing little bits and pieces in between touring we recorded in uh whitney studios in new york john butterfield my god as a tuba player got to play i was actually waiting for john butterfield to show up and the cartage guy brought in the tubas and the cartage guy with his puffy winter new york dock worker outfit the whole time i was talking to john butterfield he was the dock worker and we'd take it a, a whack at never my love and uh we continue on tour and the next thing we know jerry is not producing us and uh pat has arranged for bones how the engineer the mama's the papa's records who knows the studio that we work in studio three inside out inside out that's how how there you go i love that pun well that was mine thank you it's a good one this is Um, this is a super solid record bones goes into this i I don't remember what else we had dabbled with we were probably three or four songs poking around into the menu of uh, the playlist of inside out and so he had some 2020 hindsight we were still on tour so there was no big rush let's drop the needle on this and talk about the actual music it's a very interesting record it kicks off with a really kind of left of center effort from you terry wasn't it a bit like now parallel 23 
Um, <laughs> that's a weird one for you, huh? No, that's I would like to write those songs every day. It just wasn't in market for it. I would I would like to, as Jules did with some of his incredible ballads. We were writing songs with movements. Yeah. I just sat down and and dipped back into Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and I went, damn, they're writing little concertos, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I started to think, well, I'll take a little bit of the song and we'll play for 16 bars here, and then I'll do this next little bit of the song and we'll play for 16 bars. Like okay. The final lyrics for Requiem and the final lyrics for uh, Parallel 23 were both done the same night. Oh, interesting. On a bus from Minneapolis to Chicago in the middle of a severe storm. We were on tour with The Loving Spoonful. We took off from Milwaukee, in a chartered DC-8C. I have photographs. Henry Diltz was on there and a lot of photographs. We took off from Milwaukee in a chartered four-engine, big trans-oceanic propeller plane. And uh, we were going to go to Davenport, Iowa, and we couldn't get down. Anybody who was up couldn't get down unless you were going to fly to Los Angeles or something. But you couldn't get down anywhere in the in the Midwest. Everything was closed. We tried to go back to Milwaukee, and I was told that a Coast Guard plane had blown up trying to get into Milwaukee. So we were turned back. And we flew around for a long time, and I was told afterwards that we were extremely close to being out of gas. Jeez. And we we, and we got down in Minneapolis, so we split up. The Spoonfall went on to their next gig, and we got on a bus and um, went back to Chicago. I jumped up into the luggage rack of the Greyhound. I had a shearling coat. My wife was with me at the time, and I jumped up there, and I finished the lyrics for Requiem and Parallel 23 that night. One of the things I came across in my research for those tracks is that Requiem for the Masses was actually birthed out of you trying to do something in the vein of Who Killed Davey Moore, which is yes. a great, great early unreleased Dylan song, but that your effort, and this is what I love about the creative process, is that any inspiration has to go through the sausage grinder of your own perception. So man, did your sausage grinder take this idea and just rip it the fuck to pieces because the way that it came out on the other end is a whole world away. I couldn't find anybody to sing the Davy Moore thing. I didn't have a group. So that would have been before the men, I guess. I took it to the Quincy Minstrels and they loved the idea, but they sure as all hell weren't going to sing Who Killed the Davy Moore in the middle of their sunshine folk. Song. It's a great launching point, though, for a tune. And those two songs as bookends for the record gives the record an air of eccentricity that it can't shake no matter what comes in between them. Those are probably your two strangest songs. The album always sticks out in my mind as a weird one because those two songs of yours are probably your two strangest ones from mm -hmm. your time in the association. But in between those, Man, there's some great stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm you saying, realize what you just said? You realize what yeah. you just said to me? Yeah, but I'm it's not referring... Your two songs, Terry, these two weird fucking songs, there were some great shit in there. You misunderstood me. The listener base and myself prize weirdness. I mean, creating that context where it's weird and then you have these, you know, bippity boppity things as well. It brings it into a whole different realm. And to me and to all of us that are listening, we can't get enough of that. We cannot get enough of it. You know, to go right from Parallel 23 to On a Quiet Night, that is a heart stopper for me. My favorite association song is On a Quiet Night. Every element of it is so beautiful and perfect. There was a time in my life just over 10 years ago. It was when I initially discovered the song. I didn't know the song existed. Once in a blue moon, I'll come across a song and it's everything I need sonically in like an easy to digest caplet. I could not get enough of that song. I would play it over and over and over. It's an absolute abject work of art. I don't know if you guys feel even close to as strongly as I do about on a quiet night but it's something special and it should have been a huge hit no but that's what makes art so wonderful yeah 
That's absolutely what makes art so wonderful. I, I post drawings that I do almost every day, and I don't do them for posting, and I don't do them for anything. I do them because they make me happy, and other people seem to enjoy it. Uh, rather than me going on big rants about politics, I just draw something. Thank you for that, and I always respond to them. <laughs> and the stuff that I love the most just doesn't get shit from anybody, you know. And then I'll have some little weird thing that I throw up there, and everybody goes, oh, my favorite from ever. And I go, great. Who knows why that is? Um, well, the mind movie that I get when I hear this song, I picture you guys flush with success. L.A. is your fucking oyster. In fact, you own it. I see the lights of the city. I see you guys young and vibrant. And for once, not struggling and enjoying the mystery of your success. Oh, I only hear Jim. I don't really hear the group. I've always thought of it as his very beautiful personal lament. I like playing the record around. Yeah, man, that end part where it kind of goes raga y and you lay down that recorder solo is really nice. It's so pretty. It really is. I play that song for tons of people and I love the middle eight where all of a sudden it's like, boom, everybody's thinking, gotta get ahead, gotta get ahead. The way it leaps Are you out. auditioning? Are you, are you auditioning? Oh man, would I just give up everything and hit the road with you guys? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I really would. Then We Love Us, which has got to be Ted's best song. What a joyous celebration of life. It's just flush with the joy of being alive. I think, again, one of your best. That descending Celeste figure, that's one for the ages. The album was well done and about as well done as anything we, we had done. I was certainly pleased with my stuff, although I hate my lead vocal on Requiem. I hate it. it. Makes my skin crawl. What about it? It was done at dawn after about 20 hours of recording. That and the flugelhorn. I couldn't even hold the flugelhorn up. I had to brace myself on a stool. I was just really tired and sounds tired. I and mean, it's right on the beat and I don't like music that way. Right. Lagging a little bit behind the beat. Is that your preference? I don't know. You know, it's what I said last week about Peggy Lee's advice is don't ever record a song you haven't sung for three months on the road. Yeah. I didn't have the song yet. Never My Love is the second most frequently played song in America during the 20th century. On BMI. Right. Not anymore. Really? It's the first. Yeah! When did that yeah, happen? BMI just let us know about, I don't know, a month or two ago. It beat Love and Feeling out? Yep, everything. Um, That's amazing. The most played song in the history of BMI. Was it an albatross for you guys to have a hit that you're known for singing that's written by outside writers? when you're all truly capable writers yourselves? We almost didn't sing a song. It almost got forgotten because it had been on Jerry Yester's stove. He'd had a whack at it. And we had a basic track to it, but all the attention was on other shit. And for whatever reason, Warner Brothers, like, we, we need an album, we need an album. So they send Bones to New York in the middle of the tour. And we go in and we spend this just horrible day in this studio up in some high rise. And we didn't keep a thing in background vocals, not a note. And as we're leaving, I turned to Bones and I said, do you have the Idrisi tune? <laughs> and he says, yeah, I do, I do. I said, would you put that up for a second? I grabbed Larry and I said, would you just, I'm hearing something on the Idrisi tune. And I called it singing in subtone. Mm -hmm. You ask me if there will come a time, you know, which was Larry's bag. And the total opposite of my, you asked me if, you know. Pavarotti. Uh, <laughs> here comes Dr. Profundo. Um, <laughs> and we did. And that was sort of it. We cut that, went back to L.A., and then we essentially did what Don Adrisi had written. Essentially did his vocal arrangement for him and his brother Dick. We pretty much did the demo. You guys went for broke with the Adrisi brothers on side, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and then we kind of forgot about it. And then yeah. we were doing either the Red Skelton show or Steve Allen. And it was on a Sunday. And the album had just come out. Nothing had been picked. Nothing. They came in and they said, besides the already established hit, what else do you want to sing? And we hadn't selected it. All the tapes were there because we were just lip syncing. All the tapes had been sent over. Pat just turned and said, well, let's do the Adrisi song. And that's sort of how it got popped. And it's just, just one of those little things you think, you keep putting it to the side and putting it to the side, putting it to the side, and you got this little, itty, bitty, 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 bitty song. <laughs>
You know, it doesn't have a chronological evolution to it in my head. I'll tell you, everyone that lives in this house, meaning my mother, my father, right. my wife, and myself, are absolutely 100% enthralled to that song. Yeah. No, it's magic. It's just magic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what you did different in that, but perfect. And everybody's very lucky. Requiem is the B-side. Yeah. And when it got first released, about eight large markets flipped it and warner brothers for the second time got calls from the united states government and stepped on any direct promotion of the song they did it with the long conspiracy they also did it with one talk over the line they did it with all sorts of stuff it's kind of cool though that requiem was actually a top 100 song <laughs> yeah it hit number 100 <laughs> Yeah. Kind of awesome. Pretty subversive for something like that to be hitting the charts at all. There's that interesting word again, Jewel, subversive. Mm -hmm. All I'm doing is writing about what the, the last thing that a kid sees as he dies in some fucking field. Well, I mean, I call it the Flintstone vitamin theory. So if you sugarcoat anything, you can get it down anyone's throat. Yeah. Steely Dan were doing a lot of that in the 70s. But um, somebody's throat? Who are you protecting? You know, it's easy for Brewer and Shipley to sing about drugs. They look like freaks. People are expecting them to act like freaks. But with you guys, there's a Trojan horse thing going on. And the horse, <laughs> the horse is that marshmallowy vocal blend. That's the horse. So after Happiness Is, which is two Adrisi Brothers songs in a row. Uh, there we go. There we go. Now we're into pay dirt. I'm not digging for anything, I swear. I just I No, now you now you're into Pager. You start to watch the demise of the marketability of the association. Do you think it's down to those two songs? No, I I know so from program directors on the East Coast. And there's one guy by the name of Michaels. I can't remember his first name. He was out of Philadelphia. And he had hooked himself up with me. We hit it off. And he was calling up Pat. And Time for Living and Happiness Is were the two Adrisi Brothers songs that Pat and I sat down with the group and says, if you choose to record this back to what Jules was complaining about with the democratic thing. And it, it was like we were the Senate and the Congress of the United States, you know. Yes, there will be a vote and it will be adhered to and no one needs to die. Is it true that these hangings that you guys had were getting more and more intense? Yeah. We weren't going to be considered a rock group ever if those songs went out. Right. And, and they were released as singles. And it was like, goodbye, bye-bye. You talk about inconsequential yeah. lyric content. Yeah. Maybe it had been by a girls group or something like that. And I don't mean that. It would be the anti-feminist context in which that could be taken. But there were certain things that you weren't going to sing as a male group, as a balls-up male group in the United States and be taken seriously, not if you're white guys. I really wish you guys had named yourselves Balls Up. <laughs> what year are you talking about? We're, I mean, back when you guys were the inner tubes, you should have gone with Balls Up. <laughs> what An inner tube is Balls Up. <laughs> What year are you in now? We're at Insight Out, which is 67. What is going on in the world in 1967? Vietnam. Yeah, no. What else is going on? We're getting out of the summer of love. We're getting towards the domestic discontent of the Democratic National Convention, etc. As cheaply manipulated as the market was, the market with Rolling Stone magazine, etc., etc., there was a pretense of relevancy. I don't know about the free press. I don't know about, you know, any, any, any of that movement. That was a bigger concern to me than the success of the group was. And it was right about the time of uh, Time for Living that I thought, well, i got to come up with a plan to get out of here. Oh, so you were already thinking five years before you left about leaving? Speaking of that thought, yeah, I have never, ever spoken about this at all. So I'm going to give you both a, a glimpse. David Geffen and Elliot Roberts wanted to take me from the association. Wow. David was in my house all the time. He was a very dear friend of my wife's at that time. We had changed his career. And that's a whole other story where he came in as a little baby-faced guy that no one would take seriously and uh, settled a midday dispute 
at Fillmore East, where there was a matinee and a closing show, and the other act, and we had both been billed as the headliners. And David just came in and settled it. We just turned and said, who the fuck are you? He looked like he was 16, really impressed, and said, hey, hey, come here. <laughs> so uh, he got us out of the ABC contract. We were in a, a mob kind of contract. It was all the way back in the Jubilee days. That was the thing of that. And David took the association over and cut a deal that no one had ever cut before. I'm going to take your act. I'm going to pay you your commission. I'm going to book you more than you could book your act yourself. So shut up and enjoy the ride because they're not staying with you at the end of the three-year contract. So that was a huge thing for me. And I couldn't imagine myself recreating anything that would... I just said no. Without thinking about it? No consideration? Not a lot. Not a lot. My ex-wife and I have been talking about that a bunch. Pat Colesio certainly didn't know it. What was the main reason you turned it down? I think I had an investment in the association. And I hadn't yet figured it out that it wasn't going to work. I really... I was just coming to grips with the fact that I was in a band with three pretty conservative white guys. Two white guys and a Filipino. And uh, nothing about Asian Pacific people, please. That was it. Just, you know, reactionary shit. And my art desperately wanted it to go someplace else, as I would imagine Jules has did. We were not about writing regular cookie cutter, world building, two verses and repeat the second verse, have a little bridge songs anymore. You guys are searching. You're questing now. Yeah. I just, I was not happy for a long, long time. And I couldn't equate what I thought was important in the world and where I wanted to be, where I would like to be thought of as an artist. And if I couldn't find a wall in which to hang my stuff, that I could be heard in the way that I wanted to be heard. I didn't want to do it much at all. I'm going to pull out of the show right now and ask, you know, I know you're pretty outspoken about recovery. Do you want me to skip that aspect to preserve your anonymity? Or Not at all. Okay. Be careful which door you open, because I've got a great 19-hour pitch. Okay. So. <laughs> Duly noted. So at this time, with all the inner confusion you were having about this stuff, was your substance use starting to flare up in a bad way? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, my wife wants me to eat a sandwich because of my blood sugar issues. She sounds like a great woman for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have an idea or you wouldn't have been able to recognize that. I was in an Overeaters Anonymous group once, which we called ourselves Overfed and Red or <laughs> Happy Lefties. Yes. Terry, I've been an active member of OA for coming up on 10 years, over nine years with no fast food and no sugar. Wow. Pretty yeah. cool. Wow. Jesus. For years, I called my sponsor, told him my food for the whole day. It's only like the last few years I stopped. Wow. So after the two Idrisi Brothers songs aggressively kick off side two, then we have a really solid Russ song, Sometime, which I really love. Yeah. Because it feels like it starts as a straight love song and then veers into this cosmic treatise on the manifold benefits of looking within. That's how I interpret the lyrics. So I love that. I love his eccentric and weird singing style. Definitely the oddest singing style in the group. Wanted Ain't Getting is a really cool piece that Mike DC wrote. I can tell you a fun story. The background voices are singing... Bapak, who was the mucky muck of Subud, and she got pot. <laughs> she got pot. Nice. Right. And so you're hearing Bapak and she got pot at the same time. I love it. The album goes out, Warner's <laughs> calls up Bones and Pat and says, What in the hell were you thinking? You can't say she got fucked on a song. <laughs> so you go back and you listen to the mix. And it says she got fucked. When you put Bopak and Got Pot on the same, pull them down, you, it just says, she got fucked. <laughs> <laughs> she got fucked. <laughs> now, do you guys know on the Beatles song, Girl, from Rubber Soul, the middle eight, where they go, she's the kind of girl. Da -da -ba -da 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 -ba -da 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 yeah. Okay, so the backing vocals, you know what they're saying? I don't. Tit. 
They're just saying, tit, 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 tit. that's what they're saying. So much for arrested adolescents, huh? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that's that's broke out of jail adolescents. These showcases that Brian Cole got, they almost feel like a Ringo Starr kind of a deal, like he gets his showcase on each record. Reputation, Watton A. Getton. Was that kind of the idea? Let's have Brian do a gut pocket thing that he could pull off? Just give it back. You know, it was just yeah, yeah. in the middle of recording. Hey, Brian, you could do that. Jill Judges had a conversation I don't think we ever had before. 2020 hindsight that would have been really interesting to have Brian sing a lot more leads. Yeah, really. You know, some of them work better for me than others, but there's one toward the end of your recording career where it's so good and he sounds as time wore on for you guys his showcases became less rudimentary and more like fully fleshed out pop songs yeah and then he sounds like cat stevens in one late song like close to his passing i think it's on waterbeds he had a whole specific talent unto himself mm -hmm. at pulling off those kinds of tracks so here's my quick review for inside out you guys are starting to sand down your edges by now a little bit notwithstanding terry's opener and closer so for you, Terry, you're going closing, closing. <laughs> exactly. You're going balls out, esoteric and political. So, what's going on during this time for you to make this your focus artistically? Was it that pull coming out of the group or thinking about leaving? Probably the aspects of having more time. I finally have the time to sit down for a long bus ride on a blizzard night. Uh, well. But it's still strong. This is a, a really strong record for me. I think side one is the better side, but it's just stuffed with great tunes. Side two wobbles a tiny bit for me, but there's an abundance of greatness on the record. I've got it on vinyl. I recommend it to anyone I come across as one of the capstones of your career. And I give it four stars. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. What, what do you give it? In terms of product? Yeah, to divorce in, yourself. In, in, in terms of well-done product? I would give it a five. Oh, you really love it. Just, it's well done. Yeah, it really is. It's well done. And it was the only time since the first album that we have real beginning to end arrangers. Clark Burles is in from the very beginning all the way to the end. Jules, as a man from afar who's not in the band, mm -hmm. what would you give Inside Out? I agree with Terry about the uh, professionalism and the incredible arranging and the all the musicianship and singing really good on that album. And I'll, I'd give it a four because uh, a couple of songs I just cannot stand. Which, one? so, uh, Which ones don't you like? The happiness, uh, 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 mm -hmm. time, time for living. That's just not my story, you know? Yeah. It's not that I don't like it, it's just I don't have anything to do with that. I well, took off my shoes when I was about five, and it's always been that way. Not time for living, you mean happiness is? Time no, for living. No, I mean time for living. That one's on birthday, that's coming up. Oh, okay, see, I barely listened to this album. Because I was doing my own thing, you know. I just, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll give it a four, a good strong four. Yeah, it is a strong four. As far as musicianship, five. You know, Woo. and singing, just so, top of the line. Before we march on to birthday, because we're kind of getting towards a fulcrum point in the muses that you're following, it's going to start to change soon. So, one of our listeners, one of my favorite people on the planet, David Tabachman, wants to ask you guys was there a palpable tension between the success of your early MOR hits and your later, more artistic aspirations? I don't know how to compare them. You know, <laughs> they're really different. Uh, it's like two different countries. Do you like China or do you like Japan? You know, I mean, <laughs> I can't relate to that. How about you, Terry? Well, yes. There was a lot of tension for me about time and place, the world, the platform that we're, we're being afforded. You're leaving out part of the thing that the association during all this time, where we did a total of like 50 television shows. What you were wearing, what was the show, how much exposure did you get? There were all sorts of bands out there that didn't want any television exposure. Because of it was carefully controlled. Because it was all lip sync. It was like cookie cutter bullshit. And all you ever were on most of the shows, all you were was ratings booster cannon fodder. You know, where the stars of the show would never speak to you. Just where where are the, the bomb bomb boys, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, in, the, in that context, there was a lot of tension for me. And I had another life going. I had another life that was beginning to go in terms of my activism. 
in terms of what I thought I would could should be doing. And we were criticized in ways that I knew we couldn't get out of. We were really starting to take some serious shots from critical trendsetters being left out. Right. People come back and say, oh, you were the guys in the suits, you know. Elliot Roberts took me up to his house in Laurel Canyon one day from Schwab's Sunset Boulevard. And he lived straight up the hill, Laurel. And he dropped me off in David Blue. You remember David Blue? Yeah. David Blue is already in his house. And uh, it was either a telephone call or Elliot had to run out and do something. So I've never met David Blue before. I'm in the house with him in Elliot Roberts' house. And Elliot leaves and David mumps around a little bit. And finally he says, so uh, the association, you're you're the guys that sing that, uh, that faggy song, Cherish? Oh, God. I don't know whether you're going to like or dislike my answer, David, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, are you gay? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> shit like that. It's like anybody that's done television. It's like anybody that's done a movie. It's like, am I really going to get typecast? Yeah, yeah. And we were pretty actively typecasting ourselves between Warner Brothers and the rest of the guys in the group that wanted to pick songs like the Adresi Brothers' Happiness Is and Time for Living. I love Never My Love, and I, I love the hits. There's nothing wrong with that song. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, history has a way, based on what it wants to see, of attenuating the complexity or shaving down the complexity of a thing until you're a two-dimensional sketch. Well, your your view is being born in 1972 and looking back and saying, you know, I don't know much of anybody unless they were a musicologist that would really sit down and say, let me really think about the context in which this art was presented to the public. Mm -hmm. Any art, yeah. television, movies, and uh, the general audience was under a lot of pressure. And Top 40 still ruled, and FM really hadn't kicked in yet. Top 40 really ruled the roost. I got a phone call one morning at the Warwick Hotel from our office in Los Angeles. Asking if I would get up, walk out of the hotel, walk a block downtown, turn left into CBS Towers, and go do an interview on CBS FM New York, right next door. And I'm on the phone. I said, they don't play our music. We're not included in their play roster. Maybe some late night show where somebody's doing something from 66 or something. And they said, well, Ron and Cowan, Cowan and Ron arranged it. And it would really be great if you did. I said, well, get somebody else to do it. No, you're the one we want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So I get up and I have a cup of coffee and a bagel or something. And I walk over, tired, sleepy, and I go up and it's like in Saturday Night Life where I go in and the receptionist says, may I help you? And I said, I'm Terry Kirkman to see so-and-so. And then the receptionist says, and you are, and the association is a <laughs> musical group. <laughs> you know. So finally, the program director comes out and he says, I'm being asked up here to do an interview with somebody from the association. Oh, God. And I'm standing right there and I says, yeah, that would be me. And he looks at me and he says, really? I says, not my idea. He says, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> Jesus. I said, let's talk about the fact that you don't play our records and that I think you're missing out on about 75% of the really good music that's happening in the United States. And your desire to be hipper than now and to be this edgy trend center that you're actually antithetical to the art pursuits of the United States of America. And he looks at me and says, you are so fucking on. And we go down the hallway and we don't go into a studio. We go into a supply room and he takes a Nagra, we sit on the floor and he puts the microphone out and he tests and we start to talk and then he takes out a buffering bottle and he opens the buffering bottle and he's got a straw <laughs> oh, Jesus. about this big and it's cut at a bias and he goes in the buffering bottle and he comes out with the equivalent of about two lines of cocaine and puts it up my nostril <laughs> And we're recording. And then he takes up. And then a little while later, we got a little more. A little bit. I think my point was made. So, solid record. I think we're all in agreement. And next up is birthday. So, before we proceed here, let's stop. Terry, what are you, what are you smiling about? 
Between me and me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, I really appreciate your patience. <laughs> really, I know, this, I know it's a long time, but so, you know, I don't go into this much detail unless I'm truly obsessed with the band. So I want to do your story of justice. It deserves that. This, yeah, this is great. We've never done anything like this before. I tell you, we've never done anything like this before. This is really fucking great. David and Jules? Yeah. yeah. I have to pee really bad. Oh, Yeah. I have to pee. Oh, yeah? You want to take us to the bathroom? I'm just fucking with you, Jerry. Look, so he shows his dick. <laughs> his dick's name is Cherish. <laughs> was that goodbye from him? Was that it? No, that was peeing. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Oh, I do too. This is very, very interesting. I hope it jogs some stuff, you know. Yeah, it has already. You know, I always think before each episode, how far down am I training the magnifying glass? So if it's like a decent group, the glass is up here. But a group like yours, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night unless I'm covering every track. Yeah, and I know. I can I can feel what you're doing. I can tell when you're backing off and being careful and da 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 da, da which is yeah. nice. I don't feel like I'm trying to be too careful. I'm being fully you honest. I mean, thoughtful shall i yeah, say yeah. thoughtful yeah all right that about does it a heartfelt discography thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son jen and mason terry kirkman jules alexander and ruth ann friedman my incredibly loyal fans and especially the entire patreon community the soldiers of sound i love every last one of you and this show would not exist without you my friends Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes and if you don't mess with the zuck i get it just email me at info at discograffiti.com and i'll keep you in the loop so now that it's done and you want more another way to dive even deeper into the magical sounds of creamy 1960s gold is to visit episode one of this series episode 109 vashti bunyan episodes 103 and 104 Burt Summer, 83 and 84. David Crosby, 77 and 78. The Zombies with Lou Barlow, numbers 59 and 60. The Monkees, episodes 22 and 23. And part one of the Bee Gees, when they were all treacly and hadn't yet found out that they were disco kings and that the universe preferred their chests bare. That's episode number 10. I want to also say that for the first time in the show's history, since Patreon began, for the next four weeks, we are not doing Monday and Wednesday shows. And the reason for that is these episodes for the association are very long. They run from an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Some of our shows are 30, 40 minutes. Initially, what I was planning on doing was cutting out all the many digressions and doing a big Patreon thing of of, you know, all the, not outtakes, but stuff that didn't wind up in the episode. And then I just decided at a certain point that the whole idea of this series was its length, was its marathon type of feel to it. So I made it as close to a marathon as possible and then just decided no alternate shows, no nothing. This is this is the thing. And believe me, you'll be getting your listening value out of this series. However, do make sure that you visit patreon.com slash discograffiti and check out the thematically related deep dive as a music obsessive's way of life. Our Patreon's been up and running for a year, and with two episodes a week, there are close to 100 Patreon episodes at this point. That's an entire universe available to you for the price of a cup of coffee a week. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, September 15th, we're coming at you with the Association Part 3. The next installment is going to blow your mind. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Discography.